emotional sobriety is part of the spoke in, in a wheel for me or part of a slice of the pie. It's an important part. It's a foundational part for me. Welcome to Emotional Sobriety. One of the things my wife was saying something interesting to me the other day, she says, I'm bored. And literally, I think I could list the number of times I've been bored in my life in the last 10 years on one hand. <laughs> I mean, I just... Yeah. My, my life feels so filled right now. And, and so there's so much abundance in it. I don't have time to do all the things that I'm interested in doing anymore. And so it's, it was such a weird thing to hear her talk about you know, her boredom and stuff like that. Oh, there were times before, you know, at, and I have a lot of patients that say, you know, I think part of my drinking is boredom. Yeah. I just don't know how to fill my time. I don't know how to, how to take care of myself when I'm not, you know, working. Oh. Yeah, well, when, when people get sober, it's like that's so boredom. Boredom is, is like it, it's sort of it, it seems like a, a, a kind of a harmless word. But, man, that's a dangerous, dangerous thing. I, I bought myself a motorcycle. Oh, my goodness. How lovely. A small touring bike just for the roads. Mm -hmm. I'm not you know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm going to take an I used to ride. I was an avid rider at one point. Mm -hmm. I haven't done it for over 30 years. And the roads here in the Delaware Valley, these back country roads like when you guys been out here and you Tom, yep, you, yep yep i'm picturing it i was just watering to put a bike out there and it's just a, it's a 500 cc honda um but i am so damn excited i i just can't wait for the springtime to come and that's wonderful uh, Alan. and you know and i said i'm gonna take a safety class because it's been a while since i've ridden um but i'm just jazzed man i'm just jazzed that is just so cool you know, the freedom we have to do things like that. Yeah. And, it, you know, it's uh, like I said, I'm, I'm, you know, it was so funny when I bought the motorcycle from the guys were great. They were all my age. Right. <laughs> they say you're an old rider, but you're not a bold rider or else you wouldn't still be riding. <laughs> he, goes, he says there's not a lot of bold and old guys out there anymore. He uh, said, we got to be very thoughtful. And he says, look, especially where you're going to be riding from what you told me. Your trouble is not going to be cars. You're going to have to be very careful of deer running out in front of you. Oh, my goodness. Because mm -hmm. you collide with a deer on a motorcycle, man. It's it's you're going one way, the bike's going the other way, and the deer is going the other way. So right. he says, he says, you know, just my tip to you, and you'll learn this in your safety class. He says, you got to go a little bit under the speed limit around here on those back roads, especially when they're, you know, the deer are out running around and you know, jumping across the roads and stuff like that. So, so I'm excited, you guys. That's where I am today. Good for you. Good for you. I applaud you. Well, we have a guest today, Tom. I have yeah. felt <laughs> from the beginning with you is you are a kindred soul. Hmm. There has just been something where, like Tom said, you're a part of this. Hmm. Every time I felt that, and then when we talk and, and when I'm here, and there haven't been a lot of conversations, but even the brief times we have, yeah, there's yeah. been a real resonance for me mm, in terms of right. words. I, I, amen. Well, if you spot it, you got it. You know? well, that, <laughs> right. that goes in two ways, good ways that's, and bad that's ways. That's what I mean. <laughs> yeah, but this that's, is, it, this is a, 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 a beautiful way. Yeah. Well, and that's a really good point about the you spot it, you got it, because it's it's a great example of of some of the slogans and and, and cliches in in AA that that uh, um, in all twelve step programs that, that that we often will just in our cultural way we just use it for the negative, but it's like you oh, know the no. you know so often oh. you know so much a part of emotional sobriety uh, is is. Lear learning i mean and i think some of the tougher parts of emotional sobriety are are lear learning to to take you know credit where credit is due to 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 basically feel confident where you have competence you know and 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 not not have this sort of shame based false humility right you know exactly. and so i i like i like the idea that we start with the idea yeah it's it's like you know i see something in you that i that, and that means that i you know that i have the capacity to see it because i understand it i have it within in me as well exactly. that's beautiful yeah. you know in psychotherapy they have this concept about transference and counter transference and mm -hmm. transference was a patient transferring some old unfinished business right on the therapist like if you were if you had a very abusive father then you hear in the therapist's voice this criticism of you and abuse, right? Mm -hmm. Well, Freud was 
bright enough. And he says, it's not just negative, the transference. Mm-hmm. He says, you can also transfer on positive things to the person. Oh, absolutely. You know what I yeah. mean? So yeah. you see in this person things that you want or that are, see, I think of it as a part of me. Like when I saw my sponsor, Tom, back in, in 1971, and I saw who he was and the freedom he had, I didn't realize it at the time, but I was also seeing a possibility in me. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right. But I couldn't have told you that. Right. I saw it in um, him. I couldn't see it in myself because it was projected, right? right? When it's projected, it's disowned. I couldn't see it in myself, but if I didn't have it, I couldn't spot it. Yes, that's right. And that's exactly what you're saying. So yes. tell us about your journey, man, and your journey in recovery and where emotional sobriety came into play for you and what it means to you today. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a simple question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you got five minutes? You got five minutes. I'm trying to, yeah, in five minutes. So, <laughs> you know, I, um, before I, you know, jump into, well, first of all, I'm so grateful for Bill's story because he taught us in his story how to share, you know, uh, what it was like and, and what happened and what it's like now you know i mean he set the platform the springboard for millions tens of millions of 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 shares but before i i you know i start i i would like to just put out some warm fuzzies and in fact i hope that stream of consciousness goes throughout the entire um, podcast is my level of appreciation for the three of you um I find it very interesting, uh, the balance of having three doctors, three, three, um, psychologists, and then, and, and then her about call her my friend. I've taken some of his workshops and what have you, and the balance, because, you know, when I first came on to the podcast, I mean, to the meeting on Thursday, um, it was too allopathic. It was too clinical for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I went, you know what, when something is difficult and I'm resisting it, keep on showing up and seeing what happens for a while. Yeah. Couldn't and what happened is I fell in love with the balance of the, I'm going to use the word allopathic again, the, 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 versus kind of the holistic or the spiritual and the balance coming together allowed me to launch into a growth mode that opened up what for me, very important, a deeper and more meaningful way of life. Mm-hmm. Um, of, you know, my, my goal, if you will, in life is to bring more peace, to myself, because when I have more peace of mind, I can say, Alan, how are you doing? And I can shut up and listen rather than Alan, how are you doing? And I can't wait for you to, to stop talking so I can tell you how I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And the balance that I've been able to uh, glean from, um, the podcast from, from the Thursday meeting again, has just been, it's been stunning. And by the way, I fail utterly at the concepts, but I am so motivated to keep on practicing and showing up because there's just a well of richness here. My story, and I like to, you know, keep it as brief as possible because I love to be in in, in the solution. I didn't drink um, during high school. I, I had a beer, I think I remember, I had a beer in college. Alcohol was not a, not even a, a, a question to me uh, during that period of time. And um, um, I, I met my first wife. She was pretty much a neighbor and she was uh, nine years old and I was 10 years old. And we never dated. Uh, and we never dated anybody else. And um, we dated each other and um, all the way through junior high school and 
high school and college and she was a smart girl so she went to berkeley i didn't have those kind of grades so i went to a junior college but my first drink was when she left for berkeley and um my heart was broken and i didn't know what to do but i knew a friend who was at ucla was in a fraternity and i called him and he said well come over and you know we'll have a drink and you'll feel better and my first experience with alcohol was alcoholic poisoning i uh i actually I took a couple of uh, swigs of um, bourbon and i finished the whole bottle and it was good that i was at ucla um that was my first exposure wow. to alcohol wow Okay, and I was, um, I guess, well, I was, well, allergy, well done, allergy. Richard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the allergy of the body, right? I mean, talk unbelievable. About how. Yeah, yeah, unbelievable. And you yeah. know, today I understand that it was because of, 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 you know, alcoholism. But I thought it was because, you know, Sandy had left for Berkeley and all that, and, mm -hmm. and I didn't take another drink again. Um, I was twenty, about twenty-two years old at that time. Um, I'm sorry, I was about, uh, let's see, about 19 or what have you. Mm -hmm. And um, anyhow, uh, she finished school, you know, I finished school. And um, um, I remember the second time I drank is that um, I had this wonderful job unloading trucks at a grocery store, part of the union from four in the morning to nine in the morning. And I had that for six years, and it took me six years to get my degree. Um, and then I went on years after to get an advanced degree in, in corporate finance, basically. And I, I um, remember, um, um, you know, Sandy and I just, we got married. We got married. So um, we hadn't dated anybody else and, and what have you. And my drinking um my second bout with alcohol basically began when i graduated from school i went to a bar i didn't drink through college I went to a bar and i said what's a good drink and he said well i don't know how about a stinger and i didn't know what a stinger was so i probably had about 15 of them and i got drunk again i got just that was my experience and then i didn't drink so I went into um, into the corporate finance business and, and what have you. And I I'm an overachiever. You know, I'm just an overachiever. And, and uh, clearly that applies to your drinking as well. Boy, that's you, for you, sure. You, <laughs> half half measures avail us. Nothing. Oh, my it's God. Like, my God. When you dive in, you dive in head first into the deep end uh, to the deep end. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. And so. Um, you know, I, I started this career. I was, I guess, about 22 years old. Here I am married to this gal and, and never had any exposure to any other women, to, to be honest with you. And um, um, I start this career and um, um, successful. I'm, I'm just saying I'm successful. And, and today I realize that the success was really based on the fear of failure. You know, um, I had to look good. I had to um, perform. This is why emotional sobriety for me, this 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 workshop, this is such an important thing because I can see, I can trace back the the maladies, the 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 sickness, if you will, on where I was. So this led me. Um, to um, um, focus in and, and then I became a marathon runner on top of it, right? Um, you know, and I, now I'm starting to drink a little bit. So I'm now like 30 years old. I've got some success going on. Um, I'm running marathons, I'm CEO of a company and, and, um, and, and I'm stopping at this place in Venice Beach, California called the Brew and Stew. And it's, you, for 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 a dollar, you get one ladle of stew and you get a brew. And I'm starting to go there every day, just you know. But I'm drinking just you know. Hey, Tom, in in, in your observation is so true about like I jump mm -hmm. jump in, but here now I'm just going. I'll have a beer, and mm -hmm. and nothing kicked in. 
So um, I said I was going to make this brief, and I, I hope I'm not um, you know, great. No, elongating it. Is, okay. No, I, well, listen, I, I think what you're doing is showing people how the thread of this emotional dependence, yes, so how it's woven through our whole life oh. without us being aware of it. I without love us being aware of it. That's it. Absolutely. It's old sickness and that we're not even aware of, of what's infecting us. The basic flaw has always been dependence, almost absolute dependence there it is. on people and circumstances. And, you know, I fall right into that cauldron. Yeah. And as I listen to my story, it, it, it is more and more apparent. apparent. So, um, so now um, Sandy and I, after eight years, and it was a heartbreak because I was with her, um, I loved her family, but we were so in different ways, um, and, and, and that marriage broke up. Mm -hmm. And um, now I meet this gal, and, and I go to work at the, um, you know, I've always been a seeker, and, and, and I've always been somebody that wants to help on some level. So I, I go to work on um, the suicide prevention hotline, and I'm told in my training that if anybody ever has, you know, a problem with suicide, um, the only hospital you could meet them at is North Hollywood um, Hospital. And the point of that is that I, I meet somebody there who is going to be who is suicidal and um, you just to walk them into this hospital. And there she is. It's a nurse. And I fall in lust and then I fall in love and, and we get married and we move to Marina Del Rey. And after three or four years, she says to me, you know, I need some roots. And in my big shotism, in my sickness, I go, well, go find us a house. She comes back and she goes, get in the car. And we drive up the road to Bel Air, California, through the gates. Mm -hmm. And we look at the house and it's an English Tudor home with a tennis court on the top and a, an Olympic pool and what have you. I don't see that. What I see is a wet bar. That's my focus. And I say to her, I said, did you have your checkbook? This is the sickness, by the way, that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Trying to look better than I feel at all times. Mm -hmm. Did you bring your checkbook? And she goes, yeah. And I said, we'll write a check. I didn't have the money in the account, but I was a, um, I, I became a white collar criminal in the investment business. And uh, we moved into that home. It was actually the managers of Sutty and Share who, who decided to move to New York and they just said, get, kind of get rid of this house. And we got it for an amazing price. And my drinking started. Wow. Um, I couldn't, you know, I, I, I just couldn't come to terms with what the material world should look like and what the real world was truly like. Um, and that's why Another way to say it, Richard, is interesting yeah. because that was the turning point in yes. see, you started with a complete compromise of your of your integrity. Absolutely. And Absolutely. So interesting that that was a pivot point and brought you headlong into a much more active drinking. That's exactly right. What a, it's a perfect observation. Yeah, yeah, that's loss of integrity. Yeah, yeah. And, and see, that's where you got lost, right? Yeah, now it's all totally. about what I have. It's all about how I look. It's all oh. about where I'm living. I mean, exactly, exactly, exactly. Torn, torn, torn to the ground, you know, torn okay. to the ground. That's right. And so the drinking became more and, 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 and more and, you know, and the um, the activity, business activity became more aberrant. Uh, I was in a fiduciary position, and um, I breached the fiduciary position on, on numerous times. Uh, it took another eight years in that marriage for me to lose everything. I lost the home in Bel Air. My wife left with another man, and I wound up living pretty much um, within a mile of Skid Row in an apartment oh my God. Um, and I was sitting there going, what the hell happened? You know, uh, the firm that I had got whittled down to a few people and what have you, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm one of those guys that, you know, 
drop me on my my butt and uh and and watch me uh climb the ladder again mm -hmm. yeah you know and um meanwhile i became a periodic drinker i swore off forever with and without a solemn oath and i could do that for months um, but then I took that first drink and I was off and running again. Um, so I lost everything. And um, here comes Alcoholics Anonymous. It's time to um, hit that incomprehensible demoralization. And what it looked like was um, I swore off rather. I, um, I said to my um, to wife at that time, I married this gal. I said, um, um, get a Bible and get my checkbook. Mm. I will never drink again. And here's the insidiousness of our disease. Mm. She brought the Bible over. I put my hand on her. I wrote a check for $25,000. I didn't have $25,000, by the way, mm. in the in the checking account. Mm -hmm. And I said, if I ever drink again, please cash this check. And my hand is on the Bible. So here is the absolute insanity three days later i was drinking yep wow three days later by the way this was um a wife that left third wife um and she left after i drank and uh, she went to cash the check and the money wasn't there so she went to the da and in the divorce decree we settled for twelve thousand five hundred dollars on that check <laughs> um god the things that we laugh at today isn't it amazing the tragedy and we oh. have some levity to take a look at it retrospectively well yeah, just, I, I, yeah well hi, hindsight is the best insight and maybe maybe the only accurate insight is yeah is hindsight and it, it's so often you know as human beings we're always trying to figure it out at the time like you know it's like you know what the fuck i, I none of us can tell an accurate story about what's going on with us right now yeah. you know we, we, yeah. we can agree to meet here in a year and talk about what was happening we'll probably have a decent decently accurate story it is a gift of hindsight that we can see now and it's not just about laughing it off or laughing laughing at it but it's it's perspective how do we laugh at it or how do we uh grow the capacity to be able to laugh at the pain that we went through because i at one point i didn't think i'd ever be able to laugh at it where do you think oh, that yeah. comes from i think it's part of the i think it's part of the healing i think i think it i, I think it's part of um I think it's I think it's part of the support. I think it's part of the 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 community, the recovery community. I think the idea is we you know because th this is a good example when, when we're you know the 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 four of us in the conversation we can laugh together because of identification. You know, and matter of fact, we're we're not likely. I don't. I'll, I'll double check this over the next coming weeks to see if I'm if I'm telling the truth as I know it. But I, I don't think we're likely to laugh laugh at things that we don't actually identify with. And so I, th I think that yeah. helps for us. To, we I think we help each other to have that because again, humor is not about be, when somebody says they have a great, good sense of humor. It's not some people who have a good sense of humor are funny. Some people are not particularly funny, but it's about, it's a sense of perspective. Yeah. People who can appreciate a good, a good a, a, a comedian have a good sense of humor. They may not be comedians themselves, but they, but they, they have that, that perspective. And I, and I think that, I think the humor, you know, but the humor perspective is, comes from in from a form of intelligence of being able to get outside of ourselves and look at it from different angles obviously at that point in time i hit an incomparable place of demoralization uh and it looked like this basically um after that uh, that drink three days after that drink i knew i had a serious problem but I was going to test it one more time. So um, I, I had a couple of dollars left on a, a credit card. And here's the sickness again manifesting in big shotism and insecurity, uh, both uh, separate, separate, you know, se separate. I'm insecure and, and I've got big shotism. Mm -hmm. And I um, get on the phone, I, I get a, a, a limousine. I get in the car, 
uh, I tell the driver, you know, I need to find some alcohol and some, some substances and whatever. I wind up in Laguna Beach at the Twin Towers on the 10th floor. I don't know how I got there. I come to at 3 o'clock in the morning. I don't know how she got there lying in, in bed next to me, but the Yellow Pages was open. And um, um, I knew I had a problem. And here is God working, starting to work in my life. Although I think he was working my life from the time I popped out. You know, I have this, this picture of, of, of what God is like. And that is I go through the birth canal. I come out. He kisses me on the forehead and says, um, have a good time and I'll call you when I need you. <laughs> and, um, you know, so I. I, I still have a little bit of a firm left. Um, maybe there's 10 or 12 people. Um, and they have these meetings in their conference room on Monday nights. And I knew what those meetings were. But, you know, as, as the big shot is and the CEO of the company, what have you, is, is that I'm not going to participate. But I knew I had this problem. So I walk into this conference room and nobody was surprised. And you right. know, all, all, all the, you know, the remaining executives that I have in this company are there and, and um, they go, well, Richard, why don't you be the timekeeper? And, and here's the control. This is why I love this emotional sobriety, because I can see what I'm doing. They hand me a little stopwatch. And there's only about 10 or 12 guys in, in, in you know, around the conference room and everybody's sharing. And you're supposed to share for three minutes. I don't care where you were in your share. When that thing hit three minutes, I go, you're done. You're done. You're wow. done. And you know what? The love in the room, nobody ever came after me and said, you know, maybe you can, you know, just allow somebody. Just, to yeah, lighten up, Richard. Lighten, lighten up. up. Okay. Exactly. That gave you something to do and they let you do it. Yeah. Compa it's compassion. It's beautiful. Compassion. Well, that's what, that's what the rooms are all, all about. Mm-hmm. Love and tolerance is our code. Yeah. And it's not a theory. It has to be practiced just like the spiritual way of life. That's right. That's my uh, introduction into Alcoholics Anonymous. I go to a meeting uh, other than that meeting. Um, and it's in a basement in a, in a um, 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 savings and loan. And it's in Beverly Hills. Of course, I'm only going to go to a Beverly Hills meeting. And I get a suit and tie on because I had a suit left and a tie and I go in and 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 it's a Sunday meeting and they have, you know, locks and bagels and the whole thing. I mean, it's a good looking meeting and I'm going, yeah, this is Alcoholics Anonymous. And I go to that meeting, you know, every week and, and at 30 days I take a chip and this little lady comes over to me and says, congratulations, shakes my hand and slips me her phone number. And um, we'll be celebrating 38 years of, of, of marriage. And I'll tell you something, it has just been a love affair for 38 years. Um, Beautiful. Wow. And that doesn't mean it didn't have a hiccup or two, mm -hmm. um, but it's been a love affair. And, you know, um, it now, you know, it takes a lot of years of living to become young. <laughs> as evidenced by Alan's motorcycle. That's uh, right. Position, you Among know? other things with Alan. Alan yeah. yeah. But and by <laughs> the way, I, you know, um, I am going to, you know, be 80 in, in the next couple of months here. And I have never felt, you know, I'm at the gym six days a week. I, um, my core, my core is the third step and the 11th step. Um, I, I can't get enough. I can't grow enough. I can't wait, um, to be involved enough. So through sponsorship, a lot of, um, uh, Emmett Fox is one of my absolute, yeah. Yeah. you know, icons along with, um, uh, uh, Keating, um, Thomas Keating, contemplative prayer. Um, you know, I'm in, in workshops and that, and, and, the life that I have is rich. I, I can back up just a few moments, and I think it's important for people to hear this. But at 30 years of sobriety, there was some um, I had had because of the marathon running. I, um, I had two hip replacements, some back surgeries, what have you. 
And um, I reset my sobriety date a little over seven years ago because um, I was taking I was taking more Vicodin than it said to take. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I still was going to meetings. I didn't drink, what have you. But, you know, um, to that own self be true. And I remember yeah. walking into my home group. At, it was 23 years I've been going to that meeting and I raised my hand as a newcomer. And people, I could hear the, you know, I was telling Patrick this story, I could hear the gasp. Mm -hmm. And I took a chip um, for 30 days, you know, I took a chip all the way up and, and I raised my hand as a newcomer at that meeting every time. And I thought that um, my life was over. I was uh, 72 years old, 31 years, almost 31 years of sobriety. And today I find out it was one of the greatest gifts that has ever come into my life. By the way, the, the reason for it is that I got involved in a project. I had been retired for, for years. I started a foundation. I was so grateful for the, the hip replacement because I found, I found some researchers that were working on alternative enhanced material for, for joint replacement. They were working in ceramics and you know how the body has an intuitive feeling to it. I felt that ceramic. I said, I want that. They said, you can't have it. It's not an FDA approved. We found a surgeon that implanted it for me. And I was so grateful. I started a foundation to raise awareness. Mm -hmm. And that foundation blossomed. We were reaching two, three million people a year. And, and we built this incredible forum with retired surgeons and what have you. And Three quarters of the way of that 20 years, one of the directors said, you know, we should start building joint replacement hospitals. And in my big shot is, and this is in sobriety, by the way, mm -hmm. this is why your emotional sobriety platform has been so important for me. In sobriety, okay, I am still trying to look better than I feel still kind of um, um, ill at ease, still trying to please you. And so when one of these directors who is a, a pretty top-notch national surgeon says, let's start, why don't you consider starting building these joint replacement hospitals? I have no idea how to build a hospital. I go, sure, let's do it. And, you know, I had a few contacts. I raised about four or five million dollars. Madeline and I put in everything we had. And seven years later, 30 days before we were breaking ground on the first hospital, our largest hospital in the Coachella Valley filed a lawsuit against us because they didn't want the competition for joint replacement. Oh and that's when the Vicodin went, okay, Let's start taking, not handfuls, mm -hmm. but instead of taking one or two a day, I was starting to take multiples a day and, and, mm -hmm. and, and I couldn't get off of it. And that's where I went into a 10 day detox and I reestablished reset of sobriety date. Okay. So that's the platform. You, you also, let me go back to something Alan had said at the very beginning. Yep. Too, that you, you also reestablished your, your integrity. That's that. that oh, see, that's that's the point. Really the, reason, the reason people people gasp, and they, they people gasp when you say you're, you're a newcomer. But it's like, and it, and you know, could you have done it without without having to do that? Could you have done that through the back door? Yeah, probably could have. But but it's like, but it's like, it's not okay. It's like Tom, it's, it's it's like yeah. Here's my observation. That's why you get the big bucks mm -hmm. because of the fact that you you just tied in what Alan said so beautifully yeah. about yeah. loss of integrity mm -hmm. back to integrity because that, today i am a man of integrity and there's there no, no doubt about it i say that yeah. all the time richard it's not what's wrong with us that's the problem it's what's right about us that we're not honoring ah. that creates the problem and that, that's that's a, it. but the other example that you're given and this is so important for our listeners to hear this and it's the same thing that i suffer from when things happen in that are things that I don't want to happen when it's not the desired outcome, I have trouble accepting it and coping with it yeah. because I'm so convinced I need things to be the way I thought they were going to be. Bingo. Hey, okay. so that moment 
you know, of contact with life, with reality, that's really where emotional sobriety fits in or emotional inebriety fits in, right? Yeah, where, where we don't know what to do, where we object, we get into a pity party, we feel bad about ourselves, or we start cursing them. How dare they? Those greedy bastards. Look at what they're doing to ruin my life or yeah. whatever it is. But yeah. none of it is based on what you said before, accepting the situation and feeling, all right, now what the hell do we do with this? Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's unfortunate. You know, but it is what it is. How are we going to cope with it? Yeah, absolutely. By the way, um, this tragedy, if you will, here I am. Matt and I have lost everything. In fact, um, it was so devastating that I would come lost home. Lost everything from, physically, right? You mean uh, we're, we're, we're talking about everything from a material standpoint. We lost all our retirement income. I mean, we lost all that and, wow. um, totally bankrupt because because of the self-will yeah. i am going to get this hospital up we had a developer who said get the first one up we'll start building them all or all, all through the united states they were small they were only twenty-five thousand square feet yeah. three ors um but it was based on a a, a model of efficiency where we could do two to three thousand hip replacement and knee replacements with really top surgeons and get them in and out. Anyhow, the point is, I'd come home from a meeting, and by the way, I threw myself into the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I started with a four forty a.m. meeting in the morning, and that that went to a six o'clock meeting, that went to a seven o'clock meeting, and and what have you. And 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 I got a sponsor, a new sponsor, after having the same sponsor for 23 years, took me through the steps as outlined in the big book, which I had done with her many, a couple of times actually. But Madeline and I would hold hands, she would write out a prayer and we would shake because we thought the sheriff was gonna come and turn the key to take our home away and our cars and what have you. Wow. Let me tell you, devastation, incomprehensible demoralization truly is the gift because here it is seven years later and i've never been at more peace we have so little relative to what we used to have materially we are so much more at peace the um the only way i can put it is simplicity leaves more room for joy mm. And then I get involved in a workshop, because that's what you call it, Alan, of emotional sobriety that, that, that charges my, my sobriety, my new sobriety after five years, because I think I've been in this for about two and a half years. How long have you been doing the emotional sobriety? Yeah, it's around about that, about two and a half, three years. Yeah. That's right. Right. Yeah. In that. You pitched at the firing line and I was so impressed. I remember reaching out to you and, and then you That's introduced right. me, you introduced me to the <clears throat> workshop. And yeah. then I, I hear going through the 12 steps with differentiated and undifferentiated. And I absolutely start relating to that. Yeah. I absolutely powerful. start relating. Am I, am I, yeah. Am I differentiated or am I undifferentiated? Which one am I and where can I go to a point where I can find more integrity using both of your words? Mm -hmm. Because the, that concept is when I'm undifferentiated versus differentiated, there is a wide berth of of lack of integrity yes you know, right it's kind of it's kind of a way of describing lack of integrity yeah it is it really yeah, is different yeah but, you know think about it this way because some listeners might not be familiar with that term yeah. that haven't tuned in to that, those workshops but let, let me just define it real quick because sure. what just came to mind one way of thinking about it is a separation from our experiences not letting the experience define us not exactly. projecting into the experience as though it's a reflection of who we are, or even more importantly, who we're not. Right. And see, the differentiation creates 
when I can be differentiated, I can experience, Bill called it a true independence of spirit. Mm -hmm. Another phrase that I use for it is an emotional autonomy. I, my well-being, my experience emotionally is not dependent on the situation. Right. It's dependent right. on how I am making contact, digesting it, coping with it, yes. the meaning I'm giving yes. to it. All of those things are the determining forces well, instead of being so fused. See, the undifferentiation is the complete fusion with the experience. Right. And differentiation is becoming separating to the point of intrapersonally to being in relationship to the experience. And, and with, with that, with that, the, the, as you often say, Alan, you have the, the literal meaning of the word responsibility, the ability to respond only with differentiation. Do we have the ability to respond with freedom? Yes. Yep. Yeah. And so going through the 12 steps as we did in in beautiful detail, Alan, you were all, all, all four of you were exquisite. But Alan, as the architect of this meeting, the way you kicked that off just piqued my interest. And then the depth of the uh, of the information and and then the sharing, the format of people who would share for the last, you know, 15, 20 minutes, 25 minutes on, mm -hmm. on this on this meeting mm -hmm. and their experience and how they were struggling with differentiation or undifferentiated and then applying some of the principles that were so beautifully put forth to this group of 165 people, mm -hmm. you know, that would show up on a regular basis was mm -hmm. was just stunning. And and it just it gave my sobriety um, weight and depth. That's the only way I, I can put it. Mm -hmm. You know, I became as my oldest son, who's 55 and he, he's not one of us. And he's just you know, he I have three incredible kids. I'm not going to sit here and brag, but they're just and, and they love their dad. And they just mm -hmm. they, they just love their dad said to me about two or three years ago and, and this guy's a lobbyist the head of a lot the largest lobbyist firm in in california on, on law enforcement and he's so you know what a lobbyist is it's like that right and so you know and he's um agnostic and, and whatever i can't speak the language to him and he goes dad you are the best version of of any time i've ever known you and that was about wow. a year into our um, emotional sobriety. Look and so sobriety wow. started getting wider and, and wider and wider. Yes. You know, wow. the base is, is, you know, the great cosmic joke is we come in and they say we don't drink. And that is just the foundation of the right. springboard that launches us into a life that is beyond our wildest dreams. And then yeah. we hook into things like emotional sobriety. We hook into going into Emmett Fox and we hook into contemplative prayer and meditation and, and, and we get launched into that fourth dimension. And I can't stay there, by the way, but I have taste of it every single day. Emotional sobriety is part of the spoke in, in a wheel for me or part of a slice of the pie. It's an important part. It's a foundational part for me because not only have we got into differentiation and, and undifferentiated and, and using the steps, then we go into self-esteem. Yeah, no, another a whole nother. I had lost. Yeah, you, you talked about losing your integrity. I had lost. What is self esteem? I, I I don't. Today I know what self esteem is about. You know, I, I was always confused about it myself. I never understood it. Yeah, yeah. I thought it had much more to do with other people than me. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was whether I was being esteemed by other people. Yeah. And it had nothing to do with it. I was it had so, no. but, that's, no. but that's because that was my whole orientation. Exactly. See, I was so oriented on other validation. Oh, and, and yes. 
people defining me that self-esteem meant how you felt about me. If you esteem me, then I had self-esteem. Well, culture, oh, culturally, just, that's one of the so reasons. And how, and look at, <laughs> and how wrong can we be and not even yeah. know we're that wrong? You perspective, know, like, right? Perspective. Right. I mean, I was in a conversation with a client just just last week about where it's like, I, I, you know, you just you kind of forget sometimes where you come from. And you realize realize that 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 idea that, you know, Nathaniel Brandon talks about about the, the most important relationship is your relationship with yourself is that we're not taught that. We're, we're not taught that at all. And it's, and it's like so much so that we don't even think about it being, it, it doesn't feel like it's something missing until you get into a group like this and somebody points it out. Yes. And because, and you, you know, you can't solve a problem that you don't know you have. Yeah. And until, and so the, the you know, that's one of the things I have always said about, you know, the recovery program in the biggest sense of the word is, you know, what we do is we get in there, bring up the lights of awareness and that will fuck everything up for you. You know, just in case, you know, just in case you think everything's going okay, take a look around and you will have plenty to keep you busy. I love the idea of widening your recovery, yes. what, what the definition of it. It's like the, the, uh, I've, I've talked to people about, you know, after, you know, you talk about the beginning being not drinking. I always say like, you know, we celebrate that in the biggest way because it's so important, but it really is simply driving the car into the mechanic and you pull open the hood and everybody applauds <laughs> and you go, <laughs> oh, there's an engine. <laughs> and then we go to work, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. And, and, and what a, what a beautiful thing. So, um, going through the steps, you know, again, using differentiated and undifferentiated mm -hmm. self-esteem, yep. the wisdom of the room, um, you know, what I love again, and I'm just going to get back to what I said, and, and then I think I'm pretty much done here, is the balancing between the clinical models and, and, and my path and others, obviously, of the spiritual path that come together, spell mother. They just mm -hmm. spell mother. <laughs> and um, being steeped, you know, by the way, I could not hear any of this clinical um, information if I didn't have and connected to a loving power who opens up the top of my head and allows me to hear and digest and then utilize the tools that you guys give us. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, what a blessing, what an absolute blessing to have, again, the clinical model, the spiritual model come together and allow me to experience more and more freedom. The most precious commodity there is peace of mind, which I strive for, you know, like I said, I'm going to be 80 in just a few months and I am so motivated for growth. Um, and, and yeah. this feeds me. You know, I, I'm reminded of a few things that Dr. Kempler said. I want to read you guys a few quotes Yeah, and it's kind of wrap up what we're talking about today. Yeah. But, but one of the things he was talking about, Tom, is what you said about the relationship with ourselves. Mm -hmm. Is that it's 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 counterculture to focus on yourself because the idea yep. is is you're being selfish, mm -hmm. and even though everything we do is about us, I mean this right. cul this culture promotes so much narcissism and selfishness. Yeah. It's we're put in this bind and say, but don't think about yourself. You're going to think about yourself all the time, but you shouldn't be doing that. And so, and 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 the issue is not thinking about ourselves. But how we're thinking about ourselves, mm, right? How we're dealing with ourselves. See, that's the part that never gets differentiated mm. enough. So well, it never even point. gets mentioned. We don't even talk about. No, my wife even, says this to her clients. Nobody even mentions that there's such a thing as positive selfishness. That's right. Mm. That's exactly. So those same seem they're like oxymoron. It's like it's not. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Excuse me. This is what Kempler says. He goes, "I can only be responsible to, and for myself." And there it ends. Mm -hmm. this, this thought frightens many people. And the word anarchy comes to mind. You see, I mm -hmm. believe that that was the, 
that was the the you know the veer that we took on this is that we were afraid if we promoted people to think about themselves that we would create this whole society where nobody would want to cooperate mm -hmm. Right. And so all this pressure is put on conformity rather than individuality. But the individuality can't go away. It's an instinctual desire to be yourself as well as to be connected. So you can't deny something so important. So he goes on to say this. He says, this thought frightens many people. The word anarchy comes to mind. Responsibility to and for oneself, on the contrary, produces greater commitment for others mm -hmm. wow beautiful he says, he says we cannot give what we do not have how many right. times have we heard that in the right, book right 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 we cannot give what we do anarchy actually results from excessive and enforced commitments mm -hmm. isn't that interesting mm -hmm. it is only when i am responsible for myself that i can make commitments with others and fulfill them mm -hmm. My sense of personal responsibility must not be extended as some kind of privilege or weapon to others for use against me, for then it is corrupted into a despicable social weed whose fruit is poisonous for blamer and blamed alike. Wow. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. Consequences yeah. are no one's fault, yet everyone's responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> it's brilliant i mean well the way he used his words and then at another point he said this listen to this um he says it is the responsibility of each of us to maximize our potential for knowing what to expect from others it is perhaps wisdom to look to ourselves in search of our own blindness when our perception is erroneous rather than to attack the other person with the label irresponsible. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, I love your vitality, you and Tom, you know, the vitality you have, the passion um, for what you do. I mean, did you just see that in Alan? You know, he just, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Listen oh. to that. Listen. I mean, it's just, I love that. And, 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 I think I have that in, in yeah, a way that also. You know? I, I recognize that in you. You know, I was talking, Herb and I did a workshop yesterday. Yeah, um, I heard, yeah. You know, unpacking disturbances, the conversation continues. And that's kind of what our, our podcast is about, emotional sobriety, the conversation continues. Right. Mm -hmm. Might be the new name for our podcast. Yeah, yeah it's perfect. Yep, yep. Because it's going an ongoing conversation mm -hmm. here. Yeah, but, but, you know, one of the things we were talking about is that one of the things that develop or that develops as we're practicing emotional sobriety is this inward searching, mm. this self-searching. Yes. And it's reinforced with a few things that Tom and I have talked about. And really, Tom really brought this to my awareness mm -hmm. is the importance of curiosity mm -hmm. along with curiosity is also the ability to be awed and surprised. Mm. In perfect. Right. Oh, I can relate to that. Oh, I'm, my God. That's, that's why perfect. I'm still so yeah. excited about yeah. this. I, I'll read that thing with Walt. And, right. and, I, and I've read it. Trust me. I mean, yeah. I've spent 20 years training with Walter. I've heard mm. him say this. But I read it now, and it's textured even yes. differently than the textured. rest. Textured. Perfect. Yeah. It's it's textured differently. I touch it differently. It means something differently. And that's the exciting thing about this. Yeah. Well, you the know? manifestation of of what we're doing, the the EP, the in phenomena, whatever you want to call it, that is 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 the joy that we get in seeing the results on how we feel and then how we project ourselves out to the world. That's it. That's it. Right on. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. listen, it has been wonderful to have you join us today. Oh Ray. my God. What a Amen. pleasure. What a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time and sharing your experience. I I know many people are going to benefit a lot from your openness, your vulnerability, your honesty, mm. and and I'm glad to get to know you more. Oh God bless you. All and Patrick, too. thank you again for your beautiful service i mean yes. you know i had he's, such a lovely conversation with him yeah
Well, uh, I've learned so much from you today, Richard, and uh, we hope to have you on again one of these days. Oh, how lovely. Well, you can be on when we rename our podcast soon, uh, Emotional Sobriety. We're probably not going to shut up. <laughs> that's, that's his version of the conversation here we go yeah i love tom because he, he'll, he'll take it and he'll put that spin of on course it. that's why we love him we call it the rutledge right. spin i've, I've right. now right. labeled right. that it's the rutledge oh, spin. it's like i'm a honored ball, right it's like the I'm, guy I'm, that throws that spitball at you it goes well, like I'm, this <laughs> i just I'm want honored. to again just acknowledge um as the architect to this emotional sobriety meeting mm -hmm. How absolutely grateful. I actually have a tear in my eye when I'm saying this. Absolutely. How grateful I am. And I know that I speak for many that you keep showing up and doing what you do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the I work, you know, yeah, you're working yeah. on, a, on, a, on a macro scale here, touching so many lives. And um, I, for one, am so very grateful. Well, I appreciate that very much. And it, it means a lot to me, you know, this. You know, Tom and I found that when this whole thing with COVID started, because that's what this yeah. this was this terrible tragedy. Yeah. Tom and I got together and we put our heads together. Yeah, we got to do something. We got to be a part of the solution. We've wow. got to try to make a difference. And so it started really with us just doing this thing. I forgot what our first thing was called, Tom. Something about surviving COVID or something. Oh, yeah, it was it was wow. a video series. COVID yeah, it was. Yeah. So that, that was the beginning of it. We just said, hey, let's just put out some ideas on giving people some tools to get through it. But then it hit me. Oh my God, the opportunity is for us to carry this message about. Oh. Money sobriety yeah. and let's take this now and go to another level and that's how the emotional sobriety workshop was born and then i then i ran it by tom and i says look you know i want to do this but i don't think i can pull it off myself well uh, there are no coincidences just series of miracles tinge your life tinge your myth cultivate your narrative with whomever you're with then we glass in hand and children on one knee. Bring some stories, bring your stories back to me. It ain't a crime to be a human. Never be ashamed to be yourself. Rest assured that whatever you're doing will entertain me like nobody else. So here's to us, my old friends Until it's time to drink the wine and break the bread again With glass in hand and children on one knee Bring some stories, bring your stories back to me